Hello fellow space engineers, GopeScope here from the GopeScope Gaming Channel, and I'm happy to welcome you to, kind of, a Voidcorp episode. And let me explain why I say kind of a Voidcorp episode, it's because this is not a narrative Voidcorp episode. There will, there will still be, of course, more narrative-driven Voidcorp episodes, but there are going to be some now, also, which feature builds that will be a part of the Voidcorp company's set of, of uh, ships and stations and things. Oh shit! Uh, but ones that I don't really have plans for including right now in the narrative series will kind of get dumped into this non-narrative series. It'll run sort of parallel to the other one. So uh, that other series is definitely still continuing, but these will just allow me to get some more videos out on these builds that aren't really going to be part of that storyline. Um, another thing to note is that there will also be a new Steam collection, uh, of which this drop pod that we're going to look at today will be a part, um, along with some other, other things that will be coming out soon. And that is a collection that will include all of the Void Corp items that don't conform to the exploration guidelines. So ones that use pistons and rotors, or perhaps uh, exceed the triangle limitations, that kind of thing. Uh, this, this build that we're going to look at today is one that's in this other collection, or will be in this other collection, because it uses pistons and rotors. So therefore it does not conform to those exploration guidelines. So as far as the story canon goes, um, storyline canon goes, it's, it's still part of the Void Corp company, or they're still made by the Void Corp company. But uh, just for keeping things clear and orderly on Steam, they're going to be in this other collection that's going to be called Void Corp Technologies. So there will be the Void Corp collection, which as always will be entirely ready for survival and conforming to the exploration guidelines. And then this other series, Void Corp Technologies, which I still intend to be all ready for survival, but may exceed or, or be outside of the bounds of those guidelines for exploration mode. So uh, with that bit of housekeeping out of the way and so that everything's clear about what's going on here, hopefully everything's clear, let's take a look at this drop pod. Now, I released some of the other drop pods earlier that are on the smaller side, kind of the disposable drop pods, uh, and then also the shuttle that's less disposable, that's designed to go up and down, carrying people back and forth from the ground to orbit and so on. Uh, and this pod is one that I, it's another kind of proof of concept thing, because obviously planets aren't out, so like the other pods, it could be that those designs don't work, don't, not even close enough to modify them to work. They could all just completely fail. And I'll have to go back to the drawing board, which is always fun, because then you get to try to figure out how to do something new. Um, but one thing I wanted to try, and that's what this drop pod is a result of, is set up a mechanism or a system inside a drop pod that would allow the pod, once it's landed, to level itself automatically. Um, so that's something that we haven't really had to worry about in Space Engineers because gravity is made by virtue of a uh, generator being attached to a grid, and it is, by virtue of it being attached the way it is, it's going to be level. You're, you're going to be standing upright, or you'll be flipped upside down and you'll be standing on the ceiling, depending on what way you have the gravity going. Uh, but you're not going to be askew unless you're in another ship that's come into range of another gravity source and you're, you know, sideways or something like that. So. Uh, on planets, however, especially if it's a drop pod kind of a thing, you're going to end up landing probably not on a perfectly flat surface. You know, you could be on the side of a hill, uh, which is kind of the example we have here. This looks relatively flat, but the whole thing is tilted, so it sort of simulates being on a hill with a bit of a slope. You could also land somewhere where there's some, you know, craters or whatever, uh, where you're kind of hanging off the side of something, and you probably want to have a way to get yourself level. Uh, you can use pistons to do that, and you could do it manually. Uh, I thought it'd be kind of neat, though, to have a deal where it's just, it automatically does it for you. Um, and so that's, that's what I was kind of going for with this ship, or this pod, rather. My concept for this pod would be, or, or intent for this pod in this system, would be to have it probably installed in a much larger pod. Something that could drop that would be kind of like a self-contained command module kind of a thing. You know, not necessarily um, something that would be attached to other things, but just be self-contained and able to land. But this one I kind of tentatively had made so that you could potentially attach other pods to it, and that's another way of doing this, I guess, would be like a module drop pod base. To make that actually work, though, you'd need to have a pretty big vehicle to be able to actually, like, pick up the other pods and bring them over to attach to this auto-leveling pod. Uh, so the idea there would be this pod would drop, it would level, and then you could attach your other your other uh, your other pods to it, which would then make them level also, and they could have their own couple of pistons that would go down to just stabilize them, but because they're attached to that grid that's already leveled, they too should be leveled. But 
I don't know how practical that's going to be, um, but I do think some kind of a large sort of defensive bunker kind of pod or, or uh, command module, something like that, could be kind of neat. The one thing about this design is you'll notice in the inside of this pod, there's not a lot of room for anything, even though it's, it's a fairly big pod, especially compared to the other ones. And that's because the auto-leveling system, at least the way I have it designed so far, does take up a little bit of space. As you can see, it's, it's a very simple idea. It's the plumb bob. You know, if, you ever, if you've ever done any kind of construction or plumbing, maybe, and you want to make sure something is you know, plumb, straight up and down, uh, you, can, you can hang a little weight on a string and wait for it to... Uh, settle into place, stop swinging around, and that's kind of pointing in the, the direction of gravity. That gives you the where you need to look. So this does that exact same thing. Um, so the, there are two rotors to allow it to move in different directions, and then there are, uh, there's an array of sensors that are set up to detect this plumb bob, so that if it's landed and it is perfectly straight, it's perfectly uh, plumb, perfectly level, none of those sensors will detect it at all, and therefore none of the pistons will extend to change the angle. I have the timing block set up so that the pistons are designed to extend down in kind of a stabilizer fashion first uh, before this other system kicks in. So they will go down far enough to make contact and for the landing gear to activate so that it's locked into place. But that second function that runs after that's done, which extends the pistons further to level the system, would not engage if it was already perfectly level because those sensors aren't detecting the piston. So if it's not level, if it's tipped to one side, um, the sensor that is activated by the plumb bob kind of deal swinging into it would then activate a corresponding piston. It would be the piston behind that sensor, which would then slowly raise the pod until that plumb bob swings back into a position where the sensor no longer detects it, which should be, at least in theory, when it's level. So that's kind of that's the general idea. Relatively simple concept. A little tricky to execute because the tolerance between those sensor ranges is, is a little difficult to get just right. I found that if you try to get it really tight so that once it's, when it's centered, it's not detecting anything, there's very, very little gap between where the sensor field stops and where that plumb bob starts, it, it frequently ends up just causing all the pistons to keep raising. And then you back it out farther so it doesn't do that, it can end up not being perfectly level. So it's a little tricky. I got it as close as I could um, going through an iterative process of just repeatedly <laughs> dropping it and seeing how it levels and quite often being frustrated to see that it didn't level the way I thought or, or one piston or two pistons inexplicably just extend all the way up for apparently no reason and maybe tip the thing over. <laughs> but uh, I got to a point where it tends to work pretty well and uh, at least the concept to me seems sound enough that I think it could work on a, a larger scale. So this is kind of like a test run of the pod. Like I said, the way that it actually comes down to the planet, it's pretty similar to the other drop pods. It's essentially just um, thrusting towards the planet and then letting gravity also pull it. And uh, timer blocks are set up to cause uh, override on a gyroscope to engage, rotate it back the other way, and use those same thrusters that propelled it toward the planet to then slow it down. That system is flawed to a degree, and I, I really wish sensors had a longer detection range uh, because the way that I needed to, to run something as large as this was off of timers because once you're within 50 meters and you're going really fast even though the dampeners can really put out a lot of force it's not nearly enough to slow it down in time um, they tend to just crash so the problem with using timers is that it's very dependent on how far from the surface you are because it's all, it's obviously, it's all set up on time. So once you initiate the sequence, um, if you're a little too far away, uh, it's going to cause you to turn around and start your retro burn sequence too early, and then you're kind of just going to drift away. Um, and that probably on an actual planet, that shouldn't really happen. What it'll cause is a, an issue where you're not going to be able to land accurately where you want, because you'll drift too far away to one side or another. In this kind of a test run thing, there's actually um, there's an end to the world. <laughs> it's, the world is flat, and there's an end to it, and, and you'll just kind of coast off, uh, which is a problem. Um, and then, of course, if you're too close, your retro burn sequence starts too late, and you crash into the ground. So there's a fairly small window there, um, and it's a little tricky to actually nail it just right. And if, if we could have sensors with longer ranges, that's something that would be 
fixable. Um, that's something that I think you could get working really well. So I'd love to see more range on those. I know there's some blueprints out for for blue, for uh, sensors that actually have much longer ranges. I'm not sure if that's something that's like, kosher to use in a in an exploration kind of a setting. So I've kind of stayed away from those. Um, if they are though, that'd be great to use them because it would it would actually fix a lot of these problems. The other thing that you could do with them is have the sensors actually running a gyroscope to make sure it's coming in somewhat level or parallel to the ground. Whereas as you can see, when it's actually landing and it's not totally parallel to the ground, you tend to hit on a corner. If you hit on the bottom square, that's a lot more surface area to spread that pressure out from the impact. If you're hitting on a corner, you're going to destroy more blocks. And if you take enough damage, the undermounted leveling system actually will be affected and won't work anymore. So um, if, there's, if there's deflection and damage to the blocks inside, that'll cause the sensors to not work quite right. Um, and of course, if, you, if sensors are destroyed, then the, the whole system's not going to work anyway. So thank you for watching, and I will be circling back around to this and the other drop pods uh, when planets finally come out so that we can see if we can get them working 100% with the actual planets um, when we figure out exactly how those work. And remember, look for this drop pod in the Steam Workshop Void Corp Technologies collection, not Void Corp collection. And I will also be adding into that testing world, the Void Corp testing world, uh, that has the other drop pods in it, as well as the orbital bombardment vessel. So all of the gravity-related items are in that world. So if you want to play with any of them, you can just load that world up. You have them all set up there. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more.